The first thing I do want to give you in regards to overcoming temptation might be a little bit different than you would think. But one, the first step in overcoming temptation, one of the most important steps of overcoming temptation is actually having good theology, right? If you don't know what theology is, it's the study of God, but usually it's surrounding like basically how you understand the scriptures and your view of God. So the first step to overcoming temptation, yes, even before you get into that battle with temptation where you have to fight, you have to resist sin and temptation, all those other things, the first step in overcoming temptation is actually having good theology, specifically understanding your current disposition towards sin and the flesh. And if you don't know what disposition means, disposition basically means your position in relationship to something else. So where you are in comparison to sin in the flesh in this current moment in your life, now that you're in Christ. And there's three very specific theological ideas that I want you to understand that are going to be vital in your battle against temptation, right? If you understand these things good and proper, it's going to make overcoming temptation so much easier for you. A part of the reason for why people struggle with sin and temptation is in part because they have bad theology and they don't understand these things about their new life in Christ. And all these things are related to the fact that now that you are in Christ, now that you belong to Jesus, things have changed in regards to your relationship with sin, right? And the first thing that you should know is this. Now that you are in Christ, you are no longer a slave to sin and the power of the sin nature is broken off of your life. And I'll explain what that means in a moment, but let's get into the scriptures for a second. Romans chapter six, verses one through seven tells us this. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? far from it. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self is crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For the one who has died is free from sin. And it's from these verses and really the entirety of Romans 6 that we get this theological truth that we're no longer slaves to sin and the power of sin nature is broken off of our lives. So let's break down Romans 6, 1 through 7. So those of us who have been baptized into Christ. So every last one of us, you read about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, have been baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ, right? We have also been baptized into his death. And with this, we've been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ is raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. Now, in part, this is speaking a little bit about you being born again, but I'm just going to put this really simply for you. You have been crap, you have been baptized into Christ, and so now you are part of his body. But with this baptism and in this baptism, your old self, as in you that was dominated by sin and that was a slave to sin, actually died and was crucified on the cross with Christ, right? And keep in mind, you as a Christian, now that you're in Christ, you're a new creation. So when you're baptized into Christ's death and raised up with him in a similar, in a manner that's similar to his resurrection, right, you're raised up in the new man or you're raised up in a new man to walk in newness of life. So now the new creation is raised up, is resurrected, and the old creation or the old man is dead. The old man is the part of you that was dominated by sin. That's the you before Christ, right? The new man or the new creation in Christ is you after Christ, and that's what's been raised up. So the old man crucified on the cross with Christ, the new man's been raised up with Christ, right? For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, so we have died a death, the old man died, so our old selves died, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. And why was our old self crucified very specifically? In order that our body of sin might be done away with. The body of sin is just simply you dominated by sin. You're obedient to the sin nature, you're obedient to the flesh, you're dominated by sin, and by all means, you can't escape this. You're bound to sin, right? So our old self was crucified with Christ on the cross in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Why are we no longer slaves to sin? For the one who is or who has died is freed from sin. So because our old self is crucified on the cross with Christ, we have died to sin. And so because we have died to sin, we are no longer slaves to sin. And now as well, with this, we've been resurrected. We're able to walk in newness of life. Really a big part of this is just painting how Jesus Christ's death on the cross completely defeated sin, amongst other things. And now we're partaking in that victory that he's given us on the cross through our faith in him. 
when you profess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, right? So all this means for us as Christians, just to put this in really simple terms, is that you are no longer a slave to sin and the power of sin and the sin nature is broken off of your life, which means for you that in any, in all opportunities in your life, in any and all situations in your life, you can now choose to not sin. You can choose righteousness, right? Because human beings, we have the flesh, we have a sin nature, which is the natural inclination towards sin. And in that, we actually became slaves to sin and we were just only obedient to sin and we could not bring ourselves to obey God. But now that Christ has freed us from the slavery of sin, we now have a choice. Before you didn't have a choice because you were a slave. And when you're a slave to something, it's your master. You don't particularly have a choice in the matter. You're going to do what your master says because you are a slave. But now because of Christ has freed us from the slavery of sin, we have a choice and we can choose to present the members of our body as slaves to righteousness instead of slaves to unrighteousness. Romans 6, 12 through 14 tells us this, and this is later, you know, after verse seven in Romans six, it says, therefore, sin is not to reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust and do not go on presenting the parts of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead and your body parts as instruments of righteousness for God. For sin shall not be master over you for you are not under the law, but under grace. So basically, Paul is saying here, now that you are no longer a slave to sin because you have died and you're free from sin, right? Because you have died and you're free from sin. Therefore, at this point, sin is not to reign or to rule in your mortal body anymore so that you do what it says. He says, don't continue to do what sin says and allow it to use the parts of your body for unrighteousness and ungodliness, but instead present your body, give your body over to God as those who are alive from the dead and to, and allow God to use your body parts as instruments for righteousness and holiness and good goodness as is now intended to do, or as is always intended to do as a human being, right? And so just to recap all this, because that may have been a lot, the fundamental theological truth that I want you to understand is that you're no longer a slave to sin anymore because of Jesus. And so with this, by all means, you can always say no to sin and you can choose to choose righteousness. You now have a choice. Before in your before Christ days, you were always going to choose sin. At some level or for another, you were always going to choose sin over God. But now you're I've come into Jesus days. You're AJ days in a sense after Jesus days, right? You have a choice by all means to choose righteousness, to follow God, to serve and to live for him. This is very important for us to know theologically as Christians, because for some of us, we think that sin is inescapable, right? Don't mix up the fact that you're going to sin because you're not perfect with like literally an inability to not sin. Jesus is giving you the ability to not sin. Right. We have an expectation for us to sin because we're not perfect, perfect. And we're going through our sanctification. Right. But that doesn't mean that we are incapable of not sinning in that very sense. Right. So all this really means for us is that now we have the choice to be able to choose righteousness in any circumstance. Now, whether no, no matter where you are or what you're doing, by all means, you can say yes to God and no to sin. You're no longer a slave to sin. You're no longer bound to it. And now you can present the members of your body as instruments for righteousness. That's the first theological truth you need to understand. I'm no longer a slave to sin. Sin is not my master. And so then therefore, if sin is not my master, I do not have to do what it says. Next is this, right? Now that you're in Christ, you have received the Holy Spirit who empowers you to resist sin and temptation. Ephesians chapter one, verses 13 to 14 tells us this. In him, you also have after or in him, you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the first installment of our inheritance in regard to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. So when you placed your faith in Christ, you believed in him, you repented and believed in the gospel, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, you received the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the first installment of God's promise of salvation, right? Basically, he's a down payment, like here's the money now, you know, just to let you know that I'm agreeing to this and then you'll see the rest of this later. For us, when we die and we be resurrected, that's when we really experience the rest of it amongst other things. But the Holy Spirit is the down payment or the first inst installation of our inheritance in Christ, right? And you receive him when you believe. Galatians 5, 16 through 17 tells us this. But I say, walk by the spirit. You will not carry out the desire of the flesh, for the desire of the flesh is against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. Right now, the key part here is Galatians 5, 16. Right. And we'll talk a little bit about 17, too. But if you walk by the spirit, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. 
to walk by the Spirit is to live a life in obedience and submission to the Holy Spirit, but basically live a life in obedience and submission to God, live a life in obedience and submission to the scriptures, and then you will not carry out the desires of the flesh, as in you will not live a life following the desires of the flesh, right? But the interesting part here is verse 17, where it says the desire of the flesh is against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. Now, before when I spoke about this, I spoke about how by all means, this means that you're always going to deal with temptation. But the other part of it is this. There's always going to be a part of you that wants to serve and to live for God. And so whenever you're being tempted in any situation, there's always going to be a part of you that says, no, we shouldn't do this. We should serve God. God, we should listen to his word and we need to fight back against this. Right. And that is because of the Holy Spirit who gives you those specific desires, because the spirit is at war with the flesh and the flesh is at war with the spirit. Right. But the theological truth is important, knowing that you receive the Holy Spirit, because the spirit of God is the one who empowers you, strengthens you to resist sin and temptation. The Bible talks about this is not by power, not by light, but by my spirit. Right. We do things by the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. God, who is within us. Right. The spirit of God, who whom we are temples of. Right. Or for. Right. So you have received the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will empower you to overcome any and all temptation. A lot of us think for whichever reason that whenever we fight against sin and temptation that we have to do things by ourselves. But no, the Holy Spirit's with us and he is the one that gives us the strength to resist any and all sin and temptation. And if we just trust in him, we rely rely on him, we are obedient and submissive to him, he will help us to overcome any and all sin and temptation, right? So that's the second theological truth you need to understand. First is that you're not a slave to sin. Second is that you receive the Holy Spirit who empowers you to resist sin and temptation. And the third theological truth that you need to understand is this. Now that you're in Christ, you have access to all the promises of God, right? Or at least the ones that are applicable to you as a Christian, right? Before you were in Christ, you only had pro you only had access to a few promises of God, right? Which is the promise of salvation for any that believe on his son. But now that you're in Christ, there's a whole lot of things that God promises you now that you belong to him. And there's four specific promises that I want you to remember. And these four are very specifically useful when it comes to overcoming sin and temptation. The first promise is this. In all temptation, God will give you a way out. First Corinthians 10, 13 tells us this. No temptation has overtaken you except something common to mankind. Let's stop there for a second. What does this mean? This means that any and all temptation that you go through in life, somebody else has been through before, right? No temptation that's overtaking you or that you deal with in this current moment, right? Is, or except, except, what? <laughs> no temptation has overtaken you except something that's common to mankind, sorry. Right, amongst other things. So any and all temptation that you go through, you're not the only person in the world that's ever gone through it. Right? Nothing's new under the sun. There's people that have gone through it before you. There's people that are going through it the same time as you. And there's going to be people that are going through it um, after you, amongst other things. Right? So understand that because a lot of people, what they struggle with when it comes to temptation is that they feel bad because they go through certain temptations. They feel like they're a certain type of sinner or a worse type of sinner in some case because they experience certain things. Oh my goodness, Lord, I'm so sorry that I go through this. I must just be the worst, the worst and all these other things. But understand, you are not alone. You're not the only person that struggles with that sin. You're not the only person that struggles with that temptation. Chances are is that you open up the scriptures, you're going to find somebody that struggles with the same thing that you struggle through. And chances are is that you go out in life, you start speaking to people a little bit, you're going to find a gazillion people that struggle through the same things that you struggle through. So don't begin to condemn yourself or feel guilty or feel ashamed and all these other things because you struggle with a certain temptation. Because at the end of the day, no temptation that's overtaking you is, or every temptation that's overtaking you is something that's literally common to mankind, right? All of us have probably got, or one, or somebody out there has gone through the same things or is going through the same things that you're going, currently going through, right? Now, the next part is verse says, and God is faithful so that he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it, right? And that's where we begin to get into the promise. And so let's read that again. And God is faithful. So God is faithful to us as he's steadfast, he's trustworthy, he's loyal. So he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. So God is not going to allow you to go through temptation that you are pretty much unable to get out, get out of beyond what you're able. But with that said temptation, right, he will provide you the way of escape also so that you'll be able to endure it. So God is always going to give you a way out of temptation. He's always, he's not going to allow you to be tempted beyond something that you're able, right? And with that temptation, he's going to provide the way of escape so that you'll be able to endure and go through it. Because at the end of the day, 
you know, because of this promise, you'll know by all means that God's going to get me out of this. So in any and every temptation that you go through, by all means, no matter what it is, this is a promise from God. God is always going to give you a way out. God is always going to bring deliverance. Now, what you have to do is endure and to hang on to this promise and believe on this promise, right? Amongst other things. But God is always going to give you a way out of this temptation. Now, the second promise that you should remember is this, right? And it's, it's that God will never leave or forsake you. For some of us, for whichever reason, we think that whenever we're struggling with sin or temptation, that God just turns his back and walks away. No, no, he doesn't. Hebrews 13, five through six tells us this. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever abandon you. So that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Right? So keeping keeping in mind this latter part of verse five and verse six, I will never desert you, nor will I abandon you. So we confidently say the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? So in any and all sin and temptation that you're going through and that you're dealing with, understand that God is going to be right there with you. Right. Some people take this idea that God hates sin. Right. So much to the point where like he's not going to even be near you if you're falling into temptation or you're struggling with temptation. No, he's the person that's right there with you helping you, supporting you, uplifting you, and giving you everything that you need to overcome that sin and temptation. He's not abandoning you when you're being tempted, but rather he's being faithful to you, right? How is he going to be able to provide a way of escape for you if he's not there, right? That doesn't make any sense. So God is never going to leave you or forsake you when it comes to temptation and overcoming sin. And make sure to keep that in mind. That's the second promise. The third is this, is that God will help you with your temptation. Because for some of us, for whichever reason, we think that when we're tempted that God wants us to deal with it by ourselves, or we think that God is just some sort of cosmic spectator that's looking at, looking at us, you know, eating some popcorn, just saying, hmm, I wonder if they'll get out of this. No, God is going to personally help you with your temptation. That is why he has sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within you so that you can live for and serve him, right? But he's going to help you with your temptation. Hebrews chapter two, verse 17 through 18 tells us this. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brothers so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people for he himself or since for since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is also able to come to the aid of those who are tempted, right? And this is talking about Jesus. Jesus was tempted in that which he has suffered, right? And so because of this, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted, being us, right? So Jesus comes to our aid and he helps us during our temptation. He gives us everything that we need during our times of temptation, comfort, scriptures, strength, everything that we need in temptation. Understand this, that God will help you in your temptation. Not only is he going to be like, okay, here's a way out for you to escape, right? Not only is he not going to leave or forsake you, he's going to hang around, but also he's going to provide you strength and he's going to walk you through overcoming (coughs) any and all temptation that you go through. He's going to aid you. He's going to help you. Do not think that you have to fight sin and temptation by yourself. That's not what the scriptures teach us. God is going to help us through these things. And quite frankly, without God's help, we would not be able to overcome them. Keep in mind, you would still be, you would still be bound to sin and a slave to sin if it wasn't because of Jesus, right? He's not going to abandon you. Come on, right? And last but not least, the fourth and a very important promise that you should remember as well is that no matter what, what we can always approach the throne of grace with confidence. Hebrews 4.16 tells us this. Therefore, let's approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace for help at the time of our need. Now, one thing I want you to understand about grace is that grace is much more than just unmerited favor. There is a layer to grace that the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians and Titus, specifically Titus 3, I believe, where there's a level to grace that it actually empowers you to do certain things, right? In Titus 3, it talks about how the grace of God has appeared to help us to deny ungodliness and basically to live well and to live holy lives in this current age, right? So there's a level to grace. And when you're going to receive grace from God, that that grace actually empowers you to do the works of God and to do the things in which he asks of you. But also at the throne of grace that we can approach in confidence, we can also receive mercy and forgiveness because sometimes by all means, you are going to fall into sin and temptation. You have already fallen to sin and temptation. You're going to fall in sin and temptation more, more than li- likely. You know, some of you, like even today, you might have fallen to sin and temptation. Now you're watching this, but still you can approach the throne of grace with confidence to receive the mercy and find the grace for help at the time of your need in which you always need it. You always need a, a lovely dose of God's forgiveness, 
his mercy and his grace, and you can receive it in abundance. It's like this idea that comes around from this verse out of Hebrews 10, which I think people take severely out of context, amongst other things, where they basically say that if you sin too much, God's going to abandon you. No, he's not. You can always, because you are his child, approach the throne of grace with confidence to receive the grace and the mercy that you need in your time of need. Right. Even if you've been going crazy for years on end, you can still come back to the throne, and receive that grace and that mercy, because that's the type of God that we serve. He's gracious. He's merciful. He's forgiving. Should you abuse grace? Absolutely not. But if you need it, go ahead and go get it because he has it for you. And grace is going to empower you and help you to get out of sin. Like the aspect of God giving you grace in spite of giving you wrath when you deserve it does help you to want to get out of sin. Because you're like, wait a second. I did not deserve forgiveness. I keep messing up and doing all these other things. I'm treating you bad, all these other things, but still you give me grace and mercy. That And that strengthens you. You know, it peps you up a little bit. You're like, you know, God, I really am going to do better next time because I want to do better. Just I want to do better by you, right? I want to do right by you. But also just the grace of God also literally just empowers us and strengthens us to resist sin and temptation and to do the works of God. So the four promises that you should remember. Right. Very specifically, because we're talking about now that you're in Christ, you have access to the promises of God. Four promises that you should remember specifically from the scriptures are in all temptation. God will give you a way out no matter what. Right. God will always give you a way out. Sometimes you might have to sit there and struggle and resist and fight and be like, man, God, can you can you like hurry up and get me out of this? But even still, you got to resist. and You got to fight. He's going to give you a way out. Right. And all temptation is going to give you a way out. Two is that he's never going to leave or forsake you. Right. He's always going to be there with you. He's not going to forsake you just because you're being tempted or that you even fall into sin. Three, God will help you with your temptation. God is always going to help you with your temptation. OK, don't think you have to fight it by yourself. God is going to support you and help you. Right. And four, no matter what, we can always approach the throne of grace with confidence to receive the grace and the mercy that we need, you know, in our for, for our time in need, amongst other things. Remember those four important promises of God. And I promise you, it's going to help you so much when it comes to overcoming sin and temptation. So these are the theological things that you need to keep in your mind, right? Because the way that you think about sin and temptation, the way that you approach sin and temptation through the way that your mindset is, is very important to overcoming it. Because if you think that you're still a slave to sin, if you think that the Holy Spirit's not going to help you, if you think that you're a non-believer, or if you think that God's going to abandon you, all these other things, it's going to make it real difficult to get out of this stuff, right? So first and foremost, understand now that you're in Christ, you're no longer a slave to sin and the power of sin nature is broken off your life. And with this, I want you to keep in mind, it doesn't mean that the flesh doesn't exist anymore. You still have to deal with the desires of the flesh. It just means that it doesn't have control over you anymore. And you can choose to reject it. You can deny yourself, right? Two, you've received the Holy Spirit who empowers you to resist sin and temptation. And three, you have access to the promises of God. And we just went over four promises of God that I want you to remember specifically, right? But now that we've gotten in a sense that temptation pregame out of the way, let's really talk about, okay, I'm actually dealing with temptation face to face. We're in a ring. What should I do whenever I'm being tempted? Right. Well, I want to tell you when you're being tempted, you're dealing with temptation and it happens. It pops up, pops up on you, you know, during your day. Temptation should trigger a fight or a flight response in you. The moment that you are tempted, you should decide right then and there in that moment on whether or not you're going to run away or to fight back. Right. And I want to be honest with you. There are certain sins that it is better for you to remove yourself, to run away the moment that you're tempted, right? That is the better choice than sitting there and trying to resist temptation in the fight against it because these sins are difficult to overcome. And if you don't run away, you might find yourself falling into these sins. And I want to give you three specific sins, actually, or sets of uh, temptations and sins that it is better for you to run away from these things than to fight them. But keep in mind, temptation should trigger a fight or flight response. Anytime that you run up on temptation, or anytime temptation runs up on you, I should say, you should, you should either be like, either I'm going to fight this or I'm going to run away. That's what it should do for you, right? So first, the first sin or a temptation where it'd be better for you to run away is sexual morality, right? Sexual morality being anything that's outside of God's design for sex and marriage. So lust, homosexuality, fornication, adultery, masturbation, pornography, all that stuff, right? This is what the Bible says. It says in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, to flee sexual immorality. Right. This is instructions from the scriptures. This is what Paul says to the Corinthians. He says, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person that a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against their own body or sins against his own body. 
right? So when it comes to sexual morality, whether it be you dealing with lust or you dealing with fornication or you dealing with homosexuality or masturbation and pornography, it is better for you to remove yourself from the situation once you get tempted. It's better for you to run away from it than to try to fight back against these things. So I'll be honest with you. Sexual immorality is a difficult sin. Sexual immorality is a difficult sin to overcome. There's a reason for why throughout the scriptures, people struggle with sexual immorality. And there's a reason why to this day, so many people in the world around us struggle with sexual immorality. It's a hard thing to overcome in part because it's pleasurable. In part because in a sense, it seems beneficial to us. In part because God has given us sexual desires that are meant to be enacted only within the marriage covenant. But for a lot of us as human beings, we're not doing it in the marriage covenant, which is a problem, right? And so this, 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 this general idea that this is something that good that God has created and we want to experience it, but we're trying to open the gift a little too early in a sense, right? So sexual morality is a difficult sin to overcome by all means. It is better for you to flee it than to fight it. Sometimes you will have to fight it, but it's better for you to run away. Be like Joseph. Genesis 39, 10 through 12. Though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. Now it happened one day that at, or that he went into the house to do his work and none of the people of the household was there inside. So she grabbed him by his garment saying, sleep with me. But he left his garment. He left his garment in her hand and he fled and went outside. Rather than committing adultery with Potiphar's wife, rather than fornicating with Potiphar's wife, falling into lust and all these other things, Joseph was just like, I'm going to honor my master. I'm going to honor my God. I'm running away, right? She wanted to sleep with him. She was lusting after him. She was trying to commit adultery with him and all, all these other things. She already committed in her heart, heart amongst other things. He's just like, no, he ran away from that temptation. He didn't push her or try to fight her off or to stay in that situation. No, he ran away. Later, got Joseph got arrested, but it's okay because that was a blessing from God in disguise. It put him into a better position in life by all means, right? So you should have the same mentality of Joseph when it comes to sexual morality. You should run away. Even if you're struggling with something like masturbation and pornography, if you know, you know that temptation is coming, coming on you, you're sitting in your bedroom, go take a walk, right? Now, I know a lot of people when they struggle with that is at nighttime. If you live by yourself, you can go take a walk or just simply remove yourself from the room. That's also fleeing that temptation. You know, go somewhere else, remove yourself from the situation. If you're struggling with fornication, right? And, you know, somebody invites you over to their house. You thought you're just going to hang out. It's going to be cool. Just have a Bible study. You thought more people were going to be there, but you two are the only ones there and they're trying to have sex with you. They're trying to fornicate. Run, remove yourself in the situation. Don't be like, oh, we can just watch a movie or maybe we can just go, you know, play a game or we can just talk or X, Y, and Z. No, you're setting yourself up for failure. Run, remove yourself. Like, I got to go, right? I got to get out of here. You know, you're driving somebody around. You pick them up for work and you're trying to drop them off. And like, they're like, oh, stop here. You know, I'm trying to do a little something, something, something like leave, get out. You know, but I'm going to drive you home, drop them off and get out of there. On other cases, if you're not driving, they're driving. Be like, hey, bro, I'm getting out right here. I'm going to call an Uber. It's that deep. It is right. Because there's certain things that we need to do to overcome sin and temptation. So when it comes to sexual immorality, Flee it. Run away. Don't put yourself in that situation. If somebody's with you one-on-one, -on -one, they're trying to fornicate, bro, remove yourself. Don't just be like, oh, I'm not interested. I'm not trying to do all these things. They're probably going to keep pressing you. People don't take no for an answer nowadays, right? But remove yourself because also in certain situations, you just got to be honest with yourself. You want to do it. You're trying not to, but you want to do it. You know how it feels. It's pleasurable. All these, all these other things, or you're curious or whatever it may be. Right. So your barriers are down, down. If somebody keeps pressing you, you're going to get in. You need to flee that temptation, run away from it. Right. So whether it's adultery, you know, whether it's lust and that's let's talk about lust here for a second. You know, if you're in a situation, let's say that you're at school, or you're at work and you see somebody that you're about to lust after or that you are having temptations to lust after, turn the other direction and go another way. Go a different way to class. Go back to your office or go back to your desk. You know, remove yourself from that situation and go rather than trying to deal with that and fight that amongst other things. You know, if you're seeing something on social media and it's tempting you to sexual immorality, turn off your phone, exit out the app, throw your phone away from you, remove yourself from that situation, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. How the sexually immoral person sins against their own body. It is no joke. It is better for you to flee sexual immorality than it is to fight it. A lot of people fell, fall into sexual morality simply because they try to fight it all the time. They're thinking that I'm strong enough. I can handle this only for them to end up fornicating, falling into lust, masturbating, watching pornography, 
all these other things, right? Flee sexual morality. And that's the first big sin slash temptation that I would say it's better for you to run away from than it is for you to engage in it. The second is this, but substances. If anybody's offering you drugs or alcohol, it is better for you to remove yourself from that situation than to try to resist it, especially if you priorly had issue with these things. If you were formerly a drug addict, if you're formerly an alcoholic, especially if you're formerly an alcoholic, don't, if somebody offers you a drink, right? You're at a party and people are doing all, the, all these things and people are offering you drinks, leave the party. Because first off, you're going to have too many times where you're tempted, where you're tempted, right? That can get you in trouble. It's just better for you to leave, right? Or if you're at a party and people are doing things, you thought it was a cool place, but then these people come in with drugs and stuff like that. And some people are taking them and everybody keeps offering you stuff, leave. It's better for you to leave than try to resist that. You know, it's people are smoking weed around you and all these other things. For one, like secondhand smoke is a real thing, right? And secondhand high and stuff like that is a real thing, right? People try to say it isn't, but it, but it is, right? It is better for you to leave than for you to experience that and to go through those things. And plus, drugs and alcohol can be very alluring to you, especially if you're depressed, you're anxious, you need a break, you're stressed out, you're feeling lonely, and you want to have an escape People go to drugs and alcohol, just like people go to sexual immorality. That's why it's also problematic because when it comes to these particular sins, it satisfies a desire that you have. For a lot of us, we may be looking for love or we may be looking for an escape or a stress reliever or whatever it may be, which is in part why we fall into these sins. I want to touch back on sexual immorality for a second. And so the reason for why we should flee these things is because when we're presented the opportunity to cure an immediate problem that we're having of our heart, right? And of our mind, we're not going to necessarily be like, oh, let me go pray and read the Bible. I'm like, man, let me go take this real quick. Let me go have a blunt. Let me go drink until drunkenness. Maybe let me go fornicate with somebody. It'll make me feel better for a period of time because we'd rather go for an easier, quick solution. That is why it's better for you to flee these things, right? Because at first when you're fighting, I don't want to do that. I want to honor God. But all of a sudden those thoughts start creeping up like, man, I'd love to have a break. I'm so stressed out. I got bills. I got all these things going on. Somebody just broke up with me and like things are crazy. And I just like something to like deal with this, to quell this problem, to give me a bit of an escape. And so what's an immediate and usual option? Sexual immorality, drugs, alcohol. And that's how you end up getting in trouble, right? Because eventually your barriers are going to be broken down. We should flee these things because also when you're in situations where you're encountering sexual immorality and substances, usually you're going to have multiple people tempting you and ask you to do this peer pressure is going to be on you and all these other things you're going to see people in some some cases it looks like they're having fun it's pleasurable all these other things a lot of things that are stacked on top of this that make it difficult for you to just sit there and resist it's better for you to remove yourself from that situation than it is for you to fight back against these things so sexual morality and substances drugs and alcohol it is better for you to remove yourself from these things right than it is for you to fight them sometimes you will have to fight but if you don't have the option, or it, but if you have the option between fighting and flighting or fighting and running, it is better for you to run away. And the third sin slash temptation where I think it's better for you to run away is gossip. Right? Because let's be honest here. Gossip is interesting. Drama is interesting, is it not? You know, hearing things about people that you ought not to hear, especially somebody that you want to know certain things about. And it's better for you to remove, the, remove yourself from the situation or change the subject. But it's better for you to remove yourself in a situation than to sit there and listen to that gossip. Because sometimes you sitting there and listening to that gossip is just as bad as actually sitting there saying things about people. Because not everybody that's a gossiper is always contributing to the conversation, but they're eagerly feasting on the information that's there so that they can use it at another time. And they can think about it. They can enjoy it and all these other things, right? Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 20, 19, it says, one who goes about as a slander reveals secrets, therefore do not associate with a gossip, right? That isn't that interesting? Therefore do not associate, be around with the gossip, right? So if people are gossiping around you, it's better just to move to the other room, right? Or, you know, let's say you're on a phone call and you have to be on the phone call and they start gossiping, mute the volume, Right. It's better for you to remove yourself in a situation to cut off your ability to even deal with these things and kind of just sit there and try to fight back against it. Right. When it comes to gossip, because sometimes even being complacent about the gossip that people are saying, saying and just listening to it and all those other things, because it's hard to sit there, especially when people are saying interesting things. Just be like, oh, yeah, I'm not interested in that. You know how many times people say I was not trying to listen to that conversation, but it was just so interesting. 
right? Yeah, be careful with gossip. Because when it comes to gossip, it is better for you to remove yourself and to flee amongst other things. And just to not know those things about I'm getting out of here than to fight back against it, right? Like the Bible says, one who goes about as a slanderer reveals secrets because a part of gossip is secret slander. Therefore, do not associate with a gossip. So three particular sets of sins that it would be better for you to simply just remove yourself from the equation rather than fighting back against it are sexual immorality, substances, drugs and alcohol, and gossip. Now, let's say that we don't have the option to run away anymore, right? But we have to fight. Unfortunately, we can't withdraw from the boxing match and we actually have to face sin and temptation one on one. We got We got to we got a box. We got to fight. This is what you should do, right? There's five things I want to give you. If you don't have the option to run away anymore from sin and temptation, you have to fight it. Here's five things that you can do. And these things are going to help you to overcome sin and temptation, which is what I know a lot of you actually want to hear, right? First and foremost, quote, reference, and remind yourself of the word of God. What did Jesus do when he was tempted by Satan? He fought him with the word of God. Matthew 4, 3 through 11. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him along into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. He will give his angels orders concerning you and on their hands, they will lift you up so that you do not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him along to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, go away, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil left him and behold, angels became and began to serve him. So when Jesus was tempted by the devil, what did he do to overcome this temptation? He fought him with the word of God. Keep in mind when you read Ephesians chapter six and it starts talking to you about the armor of God. The sword of the spirit is the word of God, right? The sword of the spirit is the word of God. So when it comes to you dealing with temptation, it's important for you to quote and reference or remind yourself of the word of God to attack the enemy whenever he's tempting you with the word of God. Because the thing is, is that oftentimes when you're being tempted, especially by the devil, he is going to lie to you. What is the best way to deal with a lie with the truth? Where can we find the truth ready and available in the word of God? So to dispel those lies that lead you into sin, lead you to temptation, saying like, oh, it's not that bad. God doesn't really care about this. The scriptures don't really say that. This isn't actually a sin and trying to find loopholes so that you can fall into sin and temptation, all that stuff. You better hit him in the face with the word of God. That's important to dispel those lies so that you don't fall for those lies. Also as well, as you're dealing with this, it's important to remind yourself of the word of God so you can remind yourself what how God actually feels about the situation. Because sometimes it's not the devil that's lying to you, it's you. You're the one who's trying to find loopholes. You're the one who's trying to justify about justify what you're about to do. And it's important to remind yourself of the word of God for a moment and say, hey, God doesn't approve of this, so I shouldn't be doing these things. It's also important to quote, reference, and remind yourself of the word of God so you can remind yourself of God's promises. Because sometimes we're being tempted like, God, I don't know if I can get out of this. I don't know if you're going to help me. I don't even know if you're here and all these other things, but you remind yourself of the word of God. He'll never leave or forsake me. You know, no temptations, um, no temptation that I'm dealing with or no temptation that's overtaken me. Jeez, that verse is always right, but no temptation is overtaking me except something that's common to mankind. And God is faithful. He's not going to allow me to be tempted beyond what I'm able and all, all these other things. You just got to remind yourself for a second of God's promises. And it's with that, you know, you can be strengthened. You can be encouraged to keep going through the things in which you're going through, to keep resisting against that sin and temptation. Quote and reference and remind yourself of the word of God. And in many um, situations, too, as well, like when it comes to you dealing with temptation, quoting the word of God is going to help to replace those thoughts of temptation. Right. So a thought of temptation comes in. You know, bring up the word of God to fight against it. And that's going to begin to dispel that. So then your mind can be filled up with godly things rather than all the temptations that you're struggling through. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, right? So first and foremost, when you're fighting against an temptation, one of the best things that you can do to overcome it is to quote, reference, and remind yourself of the word of God, right? The second thing you can do is this. And actually, let me rephrase this. You should do all these things together, right? Don't neglect the single one, but do all these things together. It's to pray and ask God for support. 
God is willing and able and ready to help you. We receive power from God by praying and asking him, right? A prayer, that's why a prayerless life is a powerless life. If you're not praying, you're not receiving no power from God, right? Because God's just like, I'm here to help you. All you need to do is ask. So pray and ask God for support. Matthew 26, 41 says, keep watching and praying so that you do not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. What does Jesus tell us to do? It says, keep watching and praying so that you do not come into temptation. So be vigilant, but also pray so that you do not come into temptation, right? Or fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. As you pray, God is going to begin to support you and strengthen you and help you and all these other things. And also a key part in prayer too, as well, is that prayer helps us to do the flesh, right? And it's going to make your temptation easier to, to deal with. Because as you begin to pray and beseech and talk to God while you're being tempted, especially being tempted by the flesh, right? It's going to begin to subdue and to beat down the flesh and to beat into submission until you stop getting tempted by it. Amongst other things, prayer is going to help you to get through, right? And it's going to help to deal with a lot of the other things that are coming at you too as well. So first and foremost, quote reference and remind yourself of the word of God, but also pray and ask God for support. He will help you. He will strengthen you. He'll give you everything that you need to resist and to overcome that temptation. All you need to do is ask. And third thing is this. You need to take your thoughts captive to the obedience to Christ. Second Corinthians 10, 5 talks about this, right? Taking our thoughts captive to the obedience to Christ. Any arrogance, anything that's coming against the knowledge of Christ, we need to take it captive to the obedience of Christ, right? This is so important because oftentimes our temptations start in our thoughts and our temptations continue in our thoughts and our temptations get worse in our head, right? And so if you want to make the whole deal easier and in some cases even stop things from happening, right? Or to continue or stop things from continuing, take your thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. And when you take these thoughts captive and you remove them from your mind, because you have the ability to do that because of Jesus, replace it with the word of God. So you can be in, begin to dwell on everything that's good and honorable, acceptable, holy, and righteous as worthy of praise is of any excellence. And that's of good repute, right? Take your thoughts captive. For many of us, the reason for why we struggle, especially with lust and sexual immorality is because our thoughts are out of control. And our thoughts are the things that are leading us into sin, right? Because all of a sudden these lustful thoughts start, start popping in and we try to ignore them, but then they just get even stronger, even more populous. And then next thing next, you know, we're giving into these thoughts and we're falling into sin simply because we didn't take our thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. We could have just cut that off right there, right? The temptation started, we could have ended it real soon, right? Take your thoughts captive, get rid of the bad thoughts that are in your head. And that's going to help you so much when it comes to overcoming temptation. Because for a lot of us, we're praying. We're quoting the scriptures. We're fighting back, which is fantastic. But what you need to do next is begin to clear your mind, right? And as your mind is cleared, it's going to make it easier because now that you're not thinking about that temptation, sometimes all you have to do now is just simply uh, deal with the feelings that you're having or like the urges and stuff like that, rather than having to deal with your mind is saying that you should do this. And you have to deal with the feelings that are tugging you towards it too, right? That's why it's important for you to take your thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ because your mind is a, a terrible thing. A terrible thing in a lot of different ways as in it can exercise a lot of control over you for a lot of people whatever their mind says wherever their minds go is where they go so it's very important for you to walk in the mind of christ and to also regulate your thoughts by taking your thoughts captive to the obedience of christ and as you take them captive to the obedience of christ replace these things with the word of god you're getting these lustful thoughts take these things captive to the obedience of christ i command these thoughts to leave me right now in jesus name i take these thoughts captive to the obedience of christ of lust and they replace them with the word of god any man who even looks at a woman with lustful intent has committed adultery in his heart. You know, flee sexual immorality. Every sin, of sin is outside the body. Or sexual immoral person sins against their own body. And, you know, remove bad thoughts. Insert good thoughts. Remove bad thoughts. Insert the word of God. It's going to help you so much when it comes to overcoming sin and temptation. Because for some of us, the nearly the entirety of our temptation is in our head. That's where the struggle is. And if we lose the battle in our mind, we're going to lose the battle in the physical too. Because the moment that our mind gives way to that temptation, it's over for us in the physical. We're out of it, right? So keep that in mind. So first, quote, reference, and remind yourself of the word of God. Second, pray and ask God for support because you need the help. And third, take your thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. Now, the fourth is this. Not all of us can do this, but call an accountability partner, right? If you're struggling through something and you have somebody that you can go through, talk to them. Go to their room. Call them up on the phone. Text them.
because it is not like a cowardly thing or a bad thing to ask for some help. I know for some of you like, oh, I don't want to bother them and all this, this, this and that. Look, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're meant to help one another. OK, Galatians 6, 1 through 2 says, brothers and sisters, even if a person is caught in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual are to restore such a person in a spirit of gentleness. Right. Each one looking to yourself so that you are not tempted as well. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. You should share your burdens with other people. And keep in mind, James 5, 16, confess your sins unto one another. The prayer of a righteous person avails the much when it comes about. Because when you call somebody up, you ask them for somebody for support. For first and foremost, you ask somebody that can physically stop you from doing certain things. But in other cases, you have people praying over you. Right? Intercessory prayer is powerful. Intercessory prayer changes lives. You have people praying over you. You know, you're getting encouraged in that moment. And on top of that, sometimes when it comes to an accountability partner, like you don't want to do certain things around them. You're just like, ah, yeah, since I have somebody around me, I guess I'm not going to do this right now. Because for some of us, all we need is somebody to literally report to. And we'll stop doing all types of sin and temptation. Like, oh, I don't feel like having to explain this to my mentor. I don't feel like having to explain this to my parents. I don't feel like having to explain this to my pastor. I'm not going to do this. Right. That's some of this for some of us. That's just the extra oomph that we need to get out of things. So call an accountability partner. Get somebody that helps to hold you accountable when you're struggling, because sometimes you just need some help and allow them to share a bit of that burden. Right. And to also correct you whenever you're in wrongdoing. Right. And to restore you with a spirit of gentleness. Accountability is fantastic, especially for those of you that struggle with sexual immorality. Somebody call up like I'm about to do something really stupid. I need you to convince me to get out of this. Sure. Because sometimes as human beings, it's all we need to not make these bad decisions because we're weak. Right? Sometimes we're lacking willpower. We don't have discipline. All these other things, right? So that's number four, call an accountability partner. So quote, reference, and remind yourself of the word of God. Pray and ask God for support. Take your thoughts captive to the obedience to Christ and call an accountability partner. What's the fifth one, right? The fifth one is simply just to exercise some willpower. And discipline yourself and resist sin and temptation, right? Because at the end of the day, you can pray, you can quote the word of God, you can call an accountability partner, you can take your thoughts captive to you, be to Christ. But all of that is near useless if you actually refuse to physically resist sin and temptation. If you actually refuse for you as a human being to say, no, I'm not doing this, right? The Bible says in James 4, 7, submit therefore to God, but resist the devil and he will flee from you. Right. Submit yourselves unto God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So submit to God, yield and give yourself over to him, but also literally resist, fight back, wrestle, right? The devil and he will flee from you. Some of us, we just need to fight back. First Corinthians 9, 27, Paul says this to the Corinthian church, but I strictly discipline my body and make it my slave. He disciplines himself. It makes his body subject to him so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified. He does it so he's not disqualified for preaching because if he was, if he didn't do this, he'd be a hypocrite more than likely. Right? So exercise some willpower and some discipline and just say, I'm not doing this and determine within your mind, determine within yourself. I'm not doing this. Have some self-control because some of us, at the end of the day, the reason for why we can't get out of sin and temptation is simply because we lack self-control. We don't know how to say no. We don't, have to, we don't know how to say no to our flesh. We don't know how to say no to people. We don't know how to say no to the devil. And for whichever reason, though, we do know how to say no to God, though. That doesn't make any sense. Exercise some self-control. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow after Christ. It is as simple as that. That's all you need to do. Right. Because once you get past all those other things, those things are great and amazing and you need those things. But this is the most important one. Exercise self-control, have some willpower and simply just say no. A lot of us, that's all we need to hear. Just say no. Exercise some discipline, exercise some self-control and just but I'm not doing this. Right. So these are the five things that you can do. Or that you should do, I should say, whenever you have to get into that boxing ring with sin and temptation. Quote, reference, and remind yourself of the word of God. Right? Remember Jesus. Pray and ask God for support. Take your thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. Call an accountability partner. As well, exercise some willpower and discipline and resist temptation. Now, there's one last thing I'm going to give you. Right? 
It's something else, a, a set of things I want you to keep in mind in regards to resisting temptation. And then after that, we're going to wrap things up, right? It's just four, four different things I want you to keep in mind because I've seen people deal with these things as they've gone through sin and temptation. First and foremost is this. Again, the best way to deal with temptation is simply to never be tempted in the first place. If you can avoid being tempted, you are in the best position possible. You should avoid being tempted, then flee temptation if you can, then fight it as a last resort. That's how things should go. Matthew 18, 8 through 9. Remember this, and if your hand or your foot has caused you to sin, cut it off and throw it away from you. It is better for you to enter life maimed or without a foot than to have two hands or feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eyes cause you to sin, tear it out and throw it away from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fiery hell. It is simply better for you. The best way for you to deal with temptation is literally just to never be tempted in the first place. Second, be honest with yourself and God on whether or not you want to commit certain sin. For some of us, we do want to fornicate, we do want to steal, we do want to cheat, we do want to lie, we want to walk in unforgiveness, we want to be vengeful, we want to gossip, we want to slander, we want to commit sin, right? We want to walk in sexual immorality, we want to commit certain sin. Be honest about it, right? Fine. Like, not fine as in that's okay, but fine in the sense of you have those desires. You you may be in a different part of your walk where your desires aren't refined yet. Okay. But take these things to God, surrender and submit them unto him and just be honest about it. Because when you're not honest about these things, you're lying to yourself and you're lying to God saying, oh, I don't really care about this. You know, I don't want to party or smoke or drink. I'm not really interested in that. When you get into that situation because you actually do want to do it either consciously or subconsciously, you're going to lower your guard. You're not going to be nearly as vigilant. And what's going to happen is, is that that temptation is going to sneak up on you. You're going to fall into it because you are honest on how much you actually wanted to commit that sin. Some things you don't want to do, some things you do. And just be honest about it and take it to God. And for the things that you want to do, be extra vigilant about it, okay? Don't sit there and just be like, oh, I don't really want to do it that much. No, be realistic, be extra vigilant about it. Otherwise, you're going to get yourself in trouble because you're just going to keep creeping and creeping and creeping to the line of sin eventually until you're going to fall off the ledge because you want to do it. And so because you want to do it naturally, you're going to be like, well, I'm interested. So your guard's going to be down. You're not going to put up as many borders or barriers because you're kind of hoping a little bit like, I hope I can fall into this. Keep in mind, James 1, 13 through 15. No one is to say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot tempt or cannot be tempted by evil. And he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's run its course, brings forth death. The third thing I want to give you is this. You cannot handle sin and temptation without God. Don't get arrogant. A lot of us sit there and think, God, don't worry about it. Sit on the sidelines. I got this. I'm big dog on campus. Don't worry. I can handle this. Keep in mind, the only reason for why you're no longer a slave to sin is because of Jesus. The only reason for why you're able to serve God and live for him properly and to resist sin and temptation is because of the Holy Spirit. Look, you cannot do this by yourself. You need help. You need God's help very specifically. Without him, you wouldn't be able to do any of these things. Don't get arrogant. Don't get prideful and think, oh, I can handle this. No, you can't. You might succeed one or two times, but then the third time you're going to get punched in the face. The fourth and the last thing is this, and then we're going to wrap up, right? But you should always be vigilant. Just because you haven't dealt with something in a while or even got delivered from something doesn't mean that you're immune to it. First Peter 5 eight says, be a sober spirit, be on alert or be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Sometimes as Christians, because we haven't dealt with a sin in a long, for a long period of time, we got delivered from something that we think that we're untouchable. Again, we get prideful. We think that like, oh, it'll, it'll never be that bad again. I'm going to tell you from personal experience, there are some temptations that I dealt with that were worse after I got delivered. They were worse, not better. It was harder. Drawing near to God, I'm closer to God, I got delivered. It was harder to deal with these things than it was before then, right? So always be vigilant. Don't let your guard down just because, oh, I haven't really dealt with this in a while or, oh, you know, like I've been delivered from this. I'm never going back to that. There are so many people that get delivered from stuff that they have that they go back to because they got arrogant. In a sense, there's so many people that got put in the promised land, but then went back to Egypt because they got cocky. 
oh, I don't struggle with this anymore. God set me free. Congratulations. Keep going, right? Keep being vigilant. Keep fighting back against sin because sin and temptation is no joke. It doesn't matter how spiritually strong you are. It can always sneak up on you. It can always punch you in the face. It can always hit you in the back of the head, right? Always be vigilant. Don't get cocky and remind yourself that God is the one who sets you free from these things. God is the one that's getting you through these things. And God is the reason for why these things, you're not dealing with them as much or you got delivered from it. Okay, so always be vigilant. Never, never, ever, ever put down your boundaries. And even in some cases, raise them up because now that you're set free, you know how dangerous that is. Right? You know how much has damaged you. So put up more boundaries, more things that will prevent you from falling into those things. Don't get cocky. Don't get arrogant. And don't think that you're immune to certain sins just because God has set you free from it. Because you're not. You can always slip and fall. It's not to make you paranoid, but to make you vigilant and to not be arrogant. Right? Trust that God is a deliverer and his deliverance is permanent. But don't be foolish in the sense of you. Don't be foolish in the sense of thinking that nothing bad can happen to you. Right? God delivered Israel into Egypt. There was many times where they complained. They wanted to go back to Egypt and all these other things. Or where they came into the promised land and they forsook God. And so then they got taken right back into captivity. Again, right? Don't be like Israel. Although it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one correlation. But that's everything that I have for you guys here today. We're going to head into announcements and the final benediction. And I'll see you guys in a second. So welcome back. I hope that you guys enjoyed today's sermon. I had fun. I ain't going to lie to you. Let's get into prayer and I'll let you guys go. So Heavenly Father, glory be to your name. Thank you for this time that we had here together. For the Holy Spirit, I'm going to pray so I pray a better and more effective prayer. Help your people to resist sin and temptation. I pray that they're earnestly built up and edified by this message, Father. Help them to flee for passes and to pursue righteousness, to die to themselves daily, to give no provisions to the flesh, and to deny themselves, pick up their cross, and fall to you. Purify them as vessels, use food for good works, sanctify them, and make them holy as you're holy, and help them to use everything which they've learned here today to actively resist sin and temptation, and to walk in holiness and righteousness, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen. I do hope that this sermon built up edified you guys, that you learned something new too as well, and that you are more than equipped throughout this entire sermon series to overcome temptation. Next, I believe, don't quote me on this, that we are going to talk about hearing God's voice, but that is liable to change a little bit next Sunday. But you'll know when you see the reminders, amongst other things. I just want to remind you that we have a Bible class every single Thursday at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern on Google Meets, and I put reminders here on YouTube on Instagram and on TikTok for them. It's a place where we actually have our community and talk. You can ask questions. And of course, we learn about the word of God amongst other things. And I believe next week we are talking about the fruit of the spirit. Yeah, or this upcoming week, we're talking about the fruit of the spirit as in how to receive the fruit of the spirit. So I'm inviting everybody that watches our Sunday services to come. But that's everything I got for you guys. You guys make sure you have a blessed day and know that Jesus loves you. I'll catch you on the flip side and I'll see you guys later.